Good morning, everyone. Today is Thursday, February 26, 2015. This is the week in charts. Well, once again, I think as you'll see, we have a lot to cover. So I'm going to go get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Make her some Mountain Dew, which is PepsiCo. Do not compensate me for this endorsement. But hey, if you're out there, give me a shout out. I did contact Red Bull, as I often say, and they said, um, hey, you're too fat. So, whatever. Good stuff. Today's Week of Charts is brought to you by Financial Juice. You like the juice? The juice is good. Um, follow me there, www.financialjuice.com slash Dave Landry. Uh, the way it was described to me, it's social media for the financial world, which is kind of a cool way of looking at it. There's a little news there. I'm not a big fan of news, but I do kind of uh, take a tiny peek every now and then. But uh, check it out if you get a chance. There's a screen screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. The easiest way to sum that up is just say, hey, you know what? All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, do me a favor. You read my book. You like the book? Throw me a bone. Put me up a review on Amazon.com. And obviously, uh, I asked this for two reasons. One is for ego purposes. It's nice to be appreciated. And people send me really nice emails, for which I thank you. And um, But a lot of times, they don't um, put up the review. So they'll send me a private email. Uh, but I'd like to see, if, if possible, if you could put a review up, that'd be awesome. Anyway, um, one second. I'm sorry, I had a little housekeeping handle here. I just left some windows open, and I had to close them up. Anyway, if you could do that, I'd appreciate it. You could use this little tiny arrow here. Um, what do we talk about? Well, i got a few emails this week I want to cover on some things. And then um, I also want to get into a couple other things. Give me one second here. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. My uh, my pen got packed in my bag, and uh, I can't do these presentations without a pen, so I just found my backup one. So let me just get that plugged in, and then we'll get started on this. All right, perfect. Okay, um, I got asked about, uh, like I said, I got a few questions this week, and I got asked about a double top, um, I'm sorry, uh, a TKO in uh, the... DTO. So we'll talk about that. Um, I left this little trend versus big trend slide in, and that'll make sense in just one second. We have a dead money report that I'm very excited to talk about this um, uh, today. And then uh, someone asked me uh, in German, but I'm pretty sure it's what they were asking me, how can I go through several thousand charts a day? And I'm going to explain that to you in just one second. Frenchie said, how was the trip? He's back. How was the trip, dude? The trip was awesome it was great to get out uh, to those of you who are my Facebook friends um, check out the pictures I, I one thing that was really kind of fun was to see Italian pride both old and new we had a private guide for um, a tour through Bologna and many things that I've walked right by before I was just amazed to actually know what they were many things I didn't even look up to see were over my head so it was it was an incredible habit of um, a guide for that. Um, my host, Emilio Tomasini, he knows I'm in the car, so he took me to uh, Lamborghini, Ferrari Museum, uh, Ducati Factory, which is motorcycles, obviously. That was really interesting. And then we went to uh, Pagani and uh, Scaletti Museum. So, really good trip. I did the, um, the venue, like I said, was um, really cool. Uh, it's probably a 600 year old building, and they had a big, uh, I don't know what you call it in the background, fresco or um, I'll show my avian son art, but like a huge painting in the background of the room. It was just really cool. So uh, if you're not my Facebook friend, be my Facebook friend. Um, 
there. So, and you can see some of the pictures from the trip, which was great. But the, the people were awesome. The uh, the venue was sold out, which was exciting. And uh, they treated me like a rock star. It was just uh, phenomenal. Okay. Okay, let's talk about the, did you see the new Ferrari 448? No, I was at a museum. So the ones in the museum were more, um, a little bit older. They had like an F40, and then they had, uh, of course, a California, and um, quite a few. I don't know if I saw there was one in there that might have been a 448, though. Now that I think about it, it looked more like a spaceship. I don't like the new ones as much as the older ones. The older ones are more of a work of art. The new ones are more like a spaceship. Anyway, let's uh, let's get to the markets. Sorry about that. I just get excited because uh, it was just such a such a fun time. Um, as you know, this is the USO. We're long USO, and it hasn't really taken off just yet. But the reason we're long is we have a first thrust set up. Notice that the market thrusted off the lows. Notice that we go back about, um, oh, I don't know, a month or so in time. So it's a pretty significant move. It's not just the pullback. It also notice that the, the acceleration lower has begun to sort of um, sort of wane. You know, over here was pretty much a straight downtrend, and then now just kind of slowly started bottoming out in here. So that's why I think this trend could be turning. Now, I could always be wrong, obviously. And you can see where it consolidated here. Of course, it didn't set up, but then it dropped and made a new low. And then another consolidation and dropped and made a new low. Another consolidation and dropped and made just a larger low, and then it started going up. So this right here looks like a turn so far to be. But you're always fighting with the transitional setup. You're always fighting the longer-term, bigger-picture trend. So keep that in mind. So, yes, this could just be a... Um, a bump higher in the longer term downtrend. Now let's take a look at the question for the week. And, and that's one reason I left the question for the weekend is because it's relative. Uh, first attended your weekend charts of February 12th. Excellent. Thank you. Checks in the mail. I purchased a book, The Layman's Guide to Trading. Topic for discussion. DTO, power shares, crude oil, double short, ETN. Okay, first of all, let me stop you right there couple of red flags in here, okay, double, okay, I'm not a big fan of leveraged ETFs, okay, the problem with a leveraged ETF is in the unleveraged one, like let's just say USO, your stop has to be, let's say this big, if it's two times leveraged, then your stop has to be twice as big, and if it's three times leveraged, obviously it has to be three times as big. So as a position trader, you're not doing yourself any good by trading a leveraged ETF. The only thing you're doing is you're going to create a bigger stop for yourself because remember, and I talked about this for two weeks in a row, you have to adjust your stop to the volatility of the underlying instrument. So that means that if you're using one times leverage, or which is zero leverage, then your stop is at one unit away. If you're using two times leverage, then it has to be at two units away, and three times three units away. A unit being how big, maybe a unit's a bad word, but um, the measure being how big or how far your stop has to be away to survive the short-term volatility of the market. Okay. So first of all, as a position trader, you don't want to be trading the leverage ETF. So that's that's the first strike against trading this DTO. The second is it's a short instrument, okay? Now, if you're shorting an outright stock, it's one thing. You're going to get a one-for-one one move, okay? The options people call that a delta of 100. If you're buying a short ETF as a proxy for shorting, there is a horrible tracking error, okay? And it's a little complex. It's kind of hard for me sometimes to wrap my head around it, but it's all it all centers around the fact that 
if you lose 10% in a market, you have to make back 11.1% to get to break even, okay? Just like if you lose 50% of your money, you have to make 100% return on that remaining money, money to get back to break even. So if you have an instrument that's short, and you always get into a little trouble when I try to explain it, and I'm, I'm putting it in a book where it's in a chart. It makes it a little bit easier. But if the market goes down 10%, then your, your ETF should go up 10%, okay? And then, ah, see, I'm going to get confusing already. Let's not even try to walk you through it. Just know that there is a what appears to be a decay due to tracking errors at a short ETF. Now, the third strike against the DTO is it's an ETN, which is um, does somebody know is exchange traded note or electronic traded note or something. Anyway, all you have to know about an ETN is it is a um, Derivative is a bad word, but for lack of a better word, it's a derivative based on price. There's no necessary, there's no no direct correlation that's necessarily between the two. You're you're taking a good faith that what they have done is represent represented is going to represent the underlying instrument. And some, a lot of crazy fun and games could really happen with ETNs. And I've traded them before. I never give it in much thought because my feeling has always been, hey, technicals are technicals. I don't care what the market is. But with ETNs, you really have to be a little careful. And I kind of learned, um, I got a, little, a nasty grammar a while back. I was part of an institutional project. And uh, one of the guys that was receiving the, the newsletter. It was a $40,000 a year newsletter, so quite significant uh, amount of money was being shelled out. And one of the gentlemen that was receiving it sent me a, a nasty gram. And to some extent, he was right. Now, my, <coughs> excuse me, my call was right. The trade made money. But I understand where it's coming from. As a general statement, you want to try to avoid ETNs, okay? So those are three strikes against trading the DTO to begin with. The next thing says, Chapter 3 discusses trend knockouts, and DTU is an example. So it's in an uptrend, ideally persistent uptrend. Price movement from 80 to 110 seems to quantify. Okay, let's take a look at that. So if we're looking at, he said it ran from around 80 to 110. Well, you can see that, yeah, it kind of accelerated higher, so he's correct there. I believe the TKO and buy trigger occurred. Okay, well, let's take a look at that. Well, right here, it's a, it's a, it's a trend knockout. But by the time you get to here, this is a little too extreme for a movement. You've given up about a month's worth of trading or so. And this market has imploded very sharply. So at this particular point, I would be a little bit concerned, just like when we take a look at the DTKO. I'm sorry. I have a pattern called a DT, a double time knockout. That's why I keep thinking that because it's confused me with the DTO. If we take a look at the USO, which is the unleveraged version, it's a little bit cleaner than that. You can see the move from lows, and again, you can see it goes back about a month or so, and then you have that little bit of correction here. So this looks a little bit more obvious as a turn. So again, trade the underlying ETF versus a double, a short, and an ETN, or the worst, a double short ETN, okay? So, but just looking at the pattern in and of itself, forget about all the problems with the underlying instrument, this is no longer a, T, a, a, a TKO, try to say it again, because it's dropped way too far in this slide. If anything, this looks like a possible tread that is turning. So his point is that, hey, it would have triggered here when it bounced up. And I disagree with that. I think this is too big to begin with. Now, one thing I did just for S&Gs was I flipped the chart over, 
and it's a little bit easier to see when you flip it over. Notice that this market comes down, but then notice that it does, believe it or not, even though it looks like it's accelerated lower in the other picture, it actually looks like it's begun to decelerate just a little bit in here. And then when it rallies up this much, notice that you've given up, and this is the same exact chart, but notice how your perspective changes. Look at how much trading you've taken out. Now, when you look at the upside, it doesn't look like as much, but when you flip it over, it's a pretty big deal. So if anything, you can see that, if anything, this looks like the market that has turned, okay? So it would almost be a buy here when you flip it over, which, of course, going back to the USO, it was a buy in the USO, okay? So I've looked at charts enough to where I could see this in the charts, but if you are having trouble, then by all means flip your stock over or flip your chart over and see if you still feel the same way about it. Yes, Jack, thank you for bringing that up. Jack says, uh, because of the balancing rules at the end of each day, a leverage ETF to balance causes to uh, have a buy high and sell low. Yeah, there's uh, there's there's all kinds of problems, and and it's it's kind of hard for me to wrap my head around everything. But if you are trying to track the day-to-day -day price movement, you could end up with a percentage movement over time that is much much different than the day-to-day -day movement. Okay. And yes, it, they forced a lot of these ETFs are being are forced to buy a market at the worst time, and and that's just the way they operate. So there's a lot of problems with them, especially a short or inverse short type of ETN, and or an ETN versus a um, ETF. Okay. So what else is he saying here? However, I'm wondering if uh, we entered the trade, if we've been stopped out with the consequence of price action, or should we have avoided the trade because the price was too extreme, in which case the stock should be avoided. I would say this was a trade that should have been avoided, but if you did take this trade, then you would still be long from right here. Let's say you got in above this pullback, which I would no longer call out a TKO, and your stop would be below the low here. But number one, don't trade it anyway because of the problem associated with this ETN being a double short, double leveraged, and uh, an ETN to begin with, and a short ETN. Okay, and number two, the move was too extreme to begin with. Now, the question is, uh, Shay wants to know, uh, how do I know, well, his question is, a trade transition or a short squeeze? Well, we have no way of knowing, but my feeling is that when you have a transitional pattern, it could be the shorts that are getting the market going. It could be the shorts could be the actual catalyst. So that's very possible. That's what's happening. But if the catalyst is enough, then the longs begin to come in, and if all of the shorts are squeezed out, which is not likely, then more shorts get squeezed out. So some people some people often say, well, Dave, those trend transitions, that just looks like a short squeeze. And maybe it is, but you never know if it's going to materialize into something bigger. And it might, okay? So it's possible. Okay, that was a good question. Uh, from both uh, Shea and uh, who asked me this? Ron. Okay, any questions on um, an ETN, a double leverage ETN, a short ETN, or anything along those lines? Or a trend transition? What was it? What about the tiny arrow? The tiny arrow was uh, just to my book. To give, if you want to put a book, book review, somebody just got here late and they just saw a tiny arrow as go flying by. If you want to put me a book review, uh, please put me one up. I appreciate it. Okay. 
Now, I don't speak German, but in looking at this, I could see two to three thousand, and then I see the word charts, and it looks like there's some why and how in here. So a quick Google Translate, and also it says in my August January article, um, I'm, I'm writing a series of articles uh, for the last year or so for Traders Magazine, and these have been published in Greece and in Italy, or I should say in Italian, and then uh, in, in uh, French, English, obviously, and then also in German. The, the magazine started off as a German publication, so they're all in German too. And sometimes the article, by the way, comes out in German before it does in English. And I did the, uh, just an FYI, I have the cover story, which I'm very excited about, kind of like the, you know, getting the, get the cover shot for uh, Sports Illustrated, right? That's the equivalent for me. Uh, I have the cover story in Trader's uh, article on efficiency, and that's going to be out in uh, in April, I think. So I'm um, looking very much forward uh, to seeing that. So I'm pretty sure this gentleman's asking, how can I look at two, three thousand st stocks a day? Went over to the uh, Google Translate, and that looks like exactly what he is asking. So how do I do that? Well, first, I eliminate anything that's making new highs. Because as a pullback player, I'm not going to trade a market that's making new highs. Now, what I will do is I might copy that stock over and put it in what I call my Landry 100, which is a momentum list. And the only way to get into the momentum list is to make a new high. Now, I'm not actually trading the list, although I do track it as if real trades were being made or these stocks on market are closed. And the reason I'm doing that is to track these momentum lists to see if they have some setups and because it's just kind of a fun thing to do. And one thing that is kind of interesting is many cases these stocks will go up another 100% from that new high. So it is a testament of buying new highs. Now, I know people who buy new highs outright, and I think that's a little dangerous, but if you're buying 100 new highs and putting just a, a tiny, tiny percentage of the account, of the total account, not the percentage of stop out, then it makes sense. So if I were running a fund, and I was a, if I had a fund and my rules were I have to have 100 stocks, it has to be 100 momentum stocks, then this is how it would run it. Now it has incredible performance when the market is trending, and then it chops around, obviously, when the market is not. It also has some uh, really cool nuances to it, which we don't have time to get into today. Maybe one day we'll discuss it. This is something I did, I think, discuss uh, in the stock selection course that I did, which we'll talk about in just a few seconds in more details. So I might save these stocks off to a momentum list, but I automatically know, just at a quick glance, just by looking at one bar, I know that if stocks are too high, it's not a setup for my methodology. Now, it doesn't mean that it might not become a setup and I shouldn't save it off to another list. So I'll just hit, like, my F key to flag, and I'll make a quick note of it to decide whether or not I want it in my momentum list. If I have a stock that's doing like this in my momentum list and I have a stock that's doing like this in the database, then... When I go through my momentum list, I'll probably take this one out and put this one in and then see what the, see how it all tracks out longer term. But I can instantly eliminate just by looking at one bar, looking back here, see if it's a new high or sort by new highs. And then also I have a longer term monitor over here, which shows me the last several years of performance. So by a quick glance at these two, I could say, okay, well, I'm going to put this in my momentum list, but it's not a current setup. It's making new highs, okay? Now, the other thing I will do is I'll sort by volatility, and the super high volatile stocks I will eliminate until I get to kind of like the sweet spot, wherever that is, until I start seeing setups. So I could almost eliminate the top 50 or so um, highly volatile stocks. I could also quickly el eliminate two to 300 stocks, depending on how how well the market is doing, if the market is at new highs. 
by sorting by new highs. And if we have a plenty of stocks that are at or near new highs and have not pulled back, I can almost instantly uh, eliminate those. So it becomes a calling game, and it's easy, like four or five hundred stocks can come off the top really fast. Okay, now I sort by volatility. I suppose if I wanted to, I could probably lop off anything with an HV uh, below twenty or fifty days because the chances of me trading those or pretty slim. So there's another whole bunch of stocks that can come out of the database uh, in the scanning process. Now keep in mind on this one monitor here and right next to it, which the one I'm, is actually I'm drawing on now, this is my longer term chart, okay? And on this one it's going to be like a shorter term chart, five or six months over here and then several years over here. So I'm just looking at the last few days at a quick glance to see if it's a setup I like. So that's the first thing I ask myself. If not, I'm off to the next chart, okay? So the other question I'm asking myself is, has it just made a new high and is now pulling back? Now, this is before I run a scan. I am going to run a new scan that says, hey, it has to make a new high recently, and it has to have pulled back from that high, okay? So that's the simple rule there. But when I'm just going through the entire database of tradable issues, which is about 2,500 or 3,000 stocks, these, these are the things that I do. This is the mental process I go through. And the other question I ask myself is, is it a possible transition? Is the stock way down here and doing this? Now, if it is a possible transition, a quick glance, and I think I have a slide on this coming up, but a quick glance over to my second monitor is, this is longer term, if, the, if it looks like this, and this looks like this, shorter term, so it's like, oh, this looks pretty good. Wait a minute. This thing is at high levels. Okay, so this really isn't that great of a transition. It's not coming off of multi-year all-time lows, so I'll immediately uh, eliminate it. Now, I'll also eyeball a bow tie. If I see a market that's come down like this and just kind of like doing this, my first thing is thinking, well, it might be a bow tie. Now, I'll either hot key over to see if I got a bow tie, or I will um, just kind of look at it and say, well, it looks like it's made a turn. And if it has, then, uh, again, we'll double check over here to see what it looks like. And then it might be a viable setup. Now, again, if it does look like a setup, here are a few things to look at. Okay. Now, I say a few because, as I'll say and mention in just a few minutes, it took me 14 hours in a stock selection course to describe all of the things you should look for. But here are a few main things to look for. Is the trend accelerating or decelerating? So if I have a setup, like right here, it looks pretty good. And then I look over here, and I can see it's it's got whatever characteristics, trades cleanly, looks good, persists. But then but if I look carefully and see that the market is doing this, and not this, then I want to instantly eliminate that trade. Now, getting back over to this longer term, okay, sometimes you might have, and keep in mind that personalities can change, so maybe it'll be tradable. But let's look at, let's say you got short term set up over here. It looks pretty good, okay? But longer term, it looks like this. It looks like an electrocardiogram. So I need to make a decision whether or not I want to trade this stock. Has the personality of the stock actually changed? Could we be entering, or entering into a new paradigm? Or is it going to continue to be wide and loose longer term? So I have to weigh these two and decide. Now, keep in mind that I'm not going to obsess and try to figure it all out all at once. If it looks marginally interesting to me, I'll either make a note of the stock or I'll just flag the stock. And I won't always try to make that big picture decision all at once. But nine out of ten times, I'm fairly sure whether I like it or not. But in that tenth time, I'm not going to say, well, let me just slow down, do some analysis here, and go through a laundry list of things, or I should say maybe a laundry list of things, that would help me decide whether or not I want to trade a stock. I'll just say, you know what, 
let's let's take a little bit closer look at this longer term. Let me just get through the rest of the database. And if there's something that's just jumping out of me that I absolutely love, that's a no-brainer, then I know I really don't have to spend much time going back at these look at these stocks that were somewhat mediocre or may have had some problems to analyze. Uh, of course, clean would be just the opposite. If I look over here and this thing is trading like this, nice and clean longer term, meaning that it doesn't uh, bounce around a lot, then I know I might have a decent setup. Sometimes, uh, getting back to the two monitors, let's say you have a, um, a stock on the left side, and uh, it looks like a, the mother of all setups. It looks fantastic. But then when we come over here, we see that we have a tremendous amount of trading, okay, just above where the market is. So this tells me that my gains might be limited by overhead supply. So I need to think about that. And again, as I said a minute ago, if it is a possible trend transition, and it's down here somewhere, if I look at this chart and it's up here, way up here, then I know that, wait a minute, um, this doesn't look like a major bottom. This is like halfway on its way down. So maybe it's not such a great transition okay now experience is vitally important as I've just said several times it took me 14 hours to teach a stock selection course so there are numerous things to look for okay and we've only touched upon a few but we touched upon a few pretty big ones that are worth looking at now how do you get better at this? Well, if a market, you want to say a market, just one of these stocks, let's say one of these stocks has, has taken off and made a very, and has made a sizable move, then ask yourself, was there a pattern that would have alerted me to this move? Is there something there that I could plainly see? Was there a a bow tie, a first thrust, uh, a persistent pullback, an accelerating momentum strategy type of setup, something very obvious that would have gotten me into that trade. And if you are honest with yourself and you back that chart out one day and look at it carefully and there was nothing there, then sometimes there's nothing there. You can't catch every single move when it comes to market. Sometimes things just take off. Okay, maybe a plant blew up, or maybe they had some unexpected news, or maybe something happened, and that large move was not necessarily um, detected through technical analysis. So don't always think that you're going to catch every move, but many times technicals will and do lead the way enough to make them trading, trading them worthwhile. Have you ever used a high spike in volume for a day or two as a pre-qualifier for a watch list or potential buys? No, I don't use volume. And it would take me an hour to explain why I don't use volume. But there's no way of knowing whether it's real volume or not with derivatives and flash trading and everything. And sometimes you get a spike in volume. That means that people are buying it, but also a lot of people are selling it. So just eliminate volume, and your life will get a lot easier. If you Hey, it's not buy away or highway. If you find a way to use it, knock yourself out. But it's not for me. Uh, practice, practice, practice. You want to get better at rebuilding automatic transmissions, then you know what you should do. You should rebuild some automatic transitions. You want to get better at playing guitar? Then play some guitar. My daughter is a very good guitarist. She's also a very good pianist, and uh, she's also a pretty good singer. And she wasn't always these things, but she's been at it for a while, especially the guitar. Um, I got her guitar 10 years ago, 7 years ago, 8 years ago, and she's been at it ever since. So she's pretty darn good at it. She surpassed me within about the first week or so. And she does this by practicing. So if you want to get better at looking at charts, then look at a lot of charts. And this is why 
I like looking at two to three thousand charts a day to each his own. Most people don't have this kind of uh, patience and, and you know, I hate to say time because it really doesn't take that long. If you're at it for a long time, it doesn't take that long. When I was in Italy, when we got through, uh, I kind of threw everything at them as quickly as possible. And then towards the end of the day, I said, okay, let's look at some charts and let's find some opportunities. And we went through 350 more liquid uh, Italian stocks pretty quickly, almost as fast as the software could uh, could spit them out. So, and from that, we found four or five potential opportunities. So it was kind of fun to do like a real-time experiment, and that's exactly what we do whenever I do a course. For instance, the IPO course, at the end of the course, we look for some opportunities. And then at the follow-up sessions, we look for more opportunities. Okay, and the stock selection course, we look, we we teach the theory, but then hey, we put it to practice, and we go out and we find setups. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But knock on wood, in both of those courses, we've had some phenomenal uh, stocks. And the good thing with the IPOs is a lot of those stocks are still running, so so far, so good. Knock on wood. So again, you want to get better at it, you got to keep uh, keep at it. No, she's not playing jazz guitar. She's uh playing rock and roll. When she was in seventh grade, she did Jimi Hendrix, Star Spangled Banner, which was pretty cool, making me proud. Hey, we got a dead money report this week. I guess before we get into that, let's uh, let's answer some of these uh, questions. Louise Armstrong. Louise? I don't know. That, is that his wife? <laughs> Said, if you don't practice for a day, oh, yeah, 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 the, yeah I've seen this before. Uh, this is a great quote, Phil. Thank you. Um, Louis Armstrong said this, if he doesn't practice for a day, he knows it. If he doesn't practice for two days, the fans know it. If he doesn't practice for three days, then obviously it goes on and on. Uh, yeah, I fully agree with that. Um, and the more you practice, the better you get. There's been a lot of books written on this. And I, I didn't read Talent is Overrated. And someone told me don't bother because um, no offense to the author, so maybe you should read it. Uh, because I, this gentleman knew what other books I've read on the subject and says, you've already got the gist of it, so I don't have to read it. So I don't want to say it's a bad book. I'm just saying through hearsay that a lot of the things it covered were covered in other books. Uh, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. I strongly urge you to read that book. It's on my website. <laughs> and um, it makes a lot of sense. And he talks about um, Gates and... Um, jobs and how they had some opportunities as young kids to get in a lot more computer time. And then one of those guys figured out uh, on a mainframe computer at the, at the school, you would have to punch in how much time you wanted. So let's say you punched in 30 minutes. And I'm kind of paraphrasing, so if you read the book, this might not be exactly the story, but you get the gist of it. If they punched in 30 minutes, and I guess everybody else punched in uh, – so many other minutes, somehow the computer would do a little algorithm and say, okay, well, based on what everybody else wants, we can give you 15. Well, one of those guys, in their infinite wisdom, decided that if you punched in a letter instead of a number, it would give you infinite time. So they would spend their nights in the computer room. Had they not figured that out, they would not have had this incredible amount of time on the computer. Uh, uh, thousands of time more than anyone else who was just punching in 10 or 15 minutes. So that was a huge advantage they had. Their mothers also uh, had a club or something. They would buy up time for them on computers and stuff. So the bottom line is they put in a lot of time. The Beatles was another example he used where the Beatles was playing, were playing in some clubs every night, but they played like all night long, and they would run out of things to play. So – they did the play classical music and all uh, different types of music. And if you haven't listened to some old Beatles songs, I guess they're all old now, but like every night in the middle of the song, it would be like an oompa-pa, which is, which is unheard of for popular music so or rock music. So that's kind of a cool thing. So, yeah, uh, practice is vitally important. I fully agree with you, Mr. Phil. Dave, what is a single price wave or has it been also called a single price thrust? Well, I usually don't use the word wave because that has a bit of a of a wave counting connotation. And um, 
I think you can get into a lot of trouble if you uh, start counting waves. My definition of a first thrust is a move in the market relative to the volatility of the volatility of the instrument. Okay, so a three-point move in a utility that takes a month and a half to go three points that might be a legitimate thrust. A three-point move in a biotech that bounces around six points a day is not a legitimate thrust. So there's a couple things you need to do. Compare the volatility of the instrument to itself, okay? And then on top of that, look at how far the price has moved on a time basis, okay? Now, if you go back, just use your minds on I'm not going to go back and charge just so we don't get mixed up. But if you go back to like that USO chart, it was making like two or three month highs or at least one month highs. So that took out a whole month or longer worth of trading. So that tells me that that's a possible first thrust in the making. It's possible that the trend has turned, okay? If pattern is more risky, is it corrected to risk less than usual, usual in 2%? Um, no, not really. I mean, as a general statement, I'm going to say no. Um, because we get paid by trading more volatile markets, so I'm not sure that that's um, uh, a general statement that you want to go with. I mean, if you're trading something... Um, just completely wild and crazy on a flyer, then yeah. But if something fits the core methodology, like a little biotech that's not uh, that has an HV of let's say less than a hundred, and it's set up and it's accelerating higher, we know it's volatile. But we're adjust we've adjusted our stock to that volatility, so we're not putting on that many shares anyway, and we have a 2% risk. That's no problem. But, yeah, if you have a little penny stock, um, you know, I think it might have been Phil or someone was talking to me recently about a little palladium stock that's like a penny stock, okay? If you're trading something like that, don't put a huge percentage of your portfolio into it. But if you want to fritter away a little bit of money on a uh, flyer, Okay, knowing that it's possibly gambling, then, then go for it, but just trade a small, small amount, amount that's almost meaningless, okay? But if you're trading the core methodology, you've got a good-looking setup and a volatile instrument, then you're going to be reducing your shares anyway, so don't worry about it, okay? It's up 55%. Yeah, I, I know I know all about that, Phil. I'm going to have a little talk with you about that maybe after the show. <laughs> Okay, uh, we have a dead buddy report brought to you by trendfollowingmoron.com. Now, I borrowed this definition from Investopedia. It says, a slang term for money invested in a security with minor hopes of appreciation or earning a return. If there was a way to know that you would never make money on a position, then get out. The problem is you don't know, okay? Now, if you're trading some little short-term system that you're only going to be in a market for a day or two anyway, then I can understand if you're following the system, it gets you out in two days, good, bad, or indifferent, or you get a contra-trend signal after two or three days, or whatever, that's fine. But for my methodology, if you're going to be a trend follower, and if you're going to be a swing trader who's willing to hold positions longer term, as long as they move in your favor, then sometimes you have to sit with the position because the market doesn't always move on your time frame. Now, if you're not stopped out on a position and you're following my methodology, then what do you do? What if it doesn't do anything for a day or two days or a week or two days or two weeks, I'm sorry, or two months? You don't do anything. You follow your plan. Now, let's take a look at this week's Dead Money Report. Yesterday, we had a huge jump higher 
in Ruby. And this was our original entry here back here. It's back in December. Well, now it's almost March. Three months, and it didn't do a whole lot. But we did hit that initial profit target the day before yesterday, so we took half off. It would have been really cool if, it, if this would have gapped above the profit target. But so far, so good, as you can see. Now, from here to here, that's a 33% move. And if you annualize that out, that's, that's a pretty sizable move. I think it come out, comes to about 160-something percent. I forget what the math was, but it's a lot. And if you made that much on every trade, you'd own the world quickly. So we had a stop here. We trailed it up a little bit, and we went kind of sideways. This is a, it isn't exactly the scale, but you got to get the idea. And now we're a little bit above break even on this. So if it comes back in, then, well, we'll make a little bit on the trade. But so far, so good. And you hate to use the word hope, but hopefully that won't happen. It will consolidate and take off again. So my point is follow your plan. Follow your plan. Follow your plan. If your methodology hinges upon the fact that you must occasionally catch a big winner to make it work, then follow your plan. Stay with these stocks, even if you end up with a little dead money for a while. So what? Okay? Now, there's more than one way to trade. And, again, it's not my way or highway. If I'm managing a momentum list and I see a stock that has really good momentum and I see a stock that's lost momentum, then, yeah, I might take it off my list. But if I'm trading this methodology, this trend-following methodology, as long as I'm not stopped out, I will stick with the position. But, Dave, it's losing momentum. So what? Maybe it just needs to catch its breath before it takes off again. And a lot of times I'll take stocks out of my momentum list because they've lost momentum, and then they'll take off a few days or a few weeks later. And that, that is what it is. And it, it, There's two different methodologies being applied. One is a pure momentum method, and the other is a – trend following method well but Dave it's going sideways you know you, are you do you want to follow that trend sideways well as long as the trend hasn't proven itself wrong and how do we know if it's proven itself wrong well we don't know for a fact but we know that if it takes our stop out we're wrong at least temporarily and we got to get out the way we have to exit the position so be it but if it doesn't then we stick with it so and if you if if you've uh, been watching these shows, you'll know that every so often we'll do a dead money report, and hopefully I'll have one for you again next week and a week after. We've got a couple of positions. Well, I'll show you the portfolio in one second that haven't really panned out yet. One of them being a gold, so I could actually make a pun about that. But so what? Okay, so what? Follow your plan. Your life gets a lot easier. Would you follow your plan? Okay. I mapped out the plan for you. So in this case, you didn't even have to make a plan. Get in at 1470. Take partial profits at 1770. That's a three point risk. So put your stop three points below the market. Put your stop here. Enter here. Take profits here. Okay? So what do you do? Okay? I get calls all the time. Hey Dave, that stock you put us in, it's uh it sucks. It's going down. Okay, well, what do you want me to do about it? Well, but uh, should we get out? No. What's the plan? Well, you got to stop, you know, down here. Well, follow your plan. Follow your plan. Follow the plan. Okay? So I can't say that enough. But most people, they come in here, oh, man, I'm feeling great. Make it somebody. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Oh, I better take some profits. No. Follow the plan. Follow the plan. Now. If your profit target is here and the market gets up to here, as I put out a tweet a couple days ago, when it had this little opening gap reversal, and it even, uh, yeah, when it had the opening gap reversal, I said, you know what? It's close enough to the profit target to take profits. But don't take profits if you're making 100 bucks and you're looking to make 1000 as one of my clients just recently did. Oh, I already took profits. Well, why would you take profits on that one? We're only up 100 bucks on a 100K account. That's, that's not enough profits. So what do you do? You follow the plan. You follow the plan, okay? 
if you don't follow the plan, you're never going to get big winners like this, or it's going to be rare that you do. Yeah, every now and then you get the stock to go straight up. That's wonderful. 99.99% of the other time, it doesn't. Market doesn't always move on your time frame. Shea says, I'm finding it hard to gather the psychology required to have patients get any advice. Yes, follow your plan. My throat's kind of scratchy from the trip, so I can't, I can't scream it. <laughs> but yeah, follow your plan. Um, now, there are some tips and tricks, and, and I, I love getting into the psychology of things. But what you could do is, if you can kind of detach yourself. Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. And I, I can see if you're getting punched in the face, especially by Mike Tyson, you would, it'd be hard to follow that plan. So in trading, when you begin losing money or you're watching this dead money, so, so to speak, sit there, you begin thinking about, oh, I'm losing this money. I, it's it's uh, tying up part of my account. Should there be something better I should be doing? Blah, blah, blah. You'll start all this. Um, I wish I could say the word, but it, it, it it's not... Um, I don't think it's PG-13, but anyway, you start all this uh, mental thought process, okay? And there's no need to waste all that energy on the position when all you have to do is follow your plan. Now, a tip to following the plan would be, and I think this came from uh, Douglas, whenever I'm not sure uh, where I got something from a psychological basis in trading, I always give it back to uh, Mark Douglas because he's had the biggest impact on my trading career, at least early on. His first book, The Discipline Trader, was a really good book. And um, I don't remember the second book, as I said before, having a big impact on me, but it was it was good as well, but not nearly as good as the first. And the first one, I think, is it's not written perfectly. It's got some um, errors in it. It's quirky, but it's not maybe polish is the word I'm looking for, but what he said uh, made a lot of sense to me and struck a chord. And I think one of the things that he said was to sort of view things like you're viewing, viewing a movie. Now, I get emotional and caught up in movies, uh, but I know it's not I know it's not reality, okay? And I know it's not actually happening to me, but I go through some of the emotions uh, as it was, you know. But you, you, st you can still detach yourself from it. So kind of view things as kind of like seeing a, a, a watching a movie. And I still drop F-bombs, don't get me wrong, but I try to replace as many F-bombs as possible with, oh, look at that, that's, that's interesting, or hmm, as opposed to getting very emotional. And as I've said a thousand times, now first of all, just because you decide to start trading doesn't mean you no longer have a pulse. As I've said many times before, I'll drop a few F-bombs and then go for a walk around the block, which is about two miles where I live. And when I get back in, all the positions have turned back around, and I'm back in black, at least from where they were. So what started out as a, a shitty day, and I get all pissed off, so much for PG-13, I guess, I come back in and I realize, why did I waste all that mental energy? So try to detach yourself as much as possible. Try to see things as like watching a movie. You need to see it as happening and not happening to you. And I know that's difficult, but with a little time, I think you'll get it. And I think that's a little trick that you could use. But, again... Follow your plan. Now, what's another trick? Well, let's say you suck at following your plan. You've got quite a few clients that suck at following their plan. They can't do it. Okay? And I wonder if they'll ever be able to do it. It's part of email after email after email. But what's a trick to following your plan? Well, let's just say on your next trade you're going to follow the plan now what if that trade turns to a loss so what follow the plan 
and reward yourself not for whether the trade worked or not, but for whether you followed your plan or not. The market is a bad teacher. The market will tell you that 8 out of 10 times a stock like this, if it's not working within so many days or weeks, that you should just bail out. But as long as it doesn't do anything wrong, maybe it's just consolidating and preparing for the next leg higher. Okay? So you follow your plan. Now, again, let's say you exit here or here or wherever. Okay? Many times that market will come might come back in afterwards, or if it starts going sideways, you decide to get out. Yeah, many times it might eventually stop you out. And you might save a little bit of money by micromanaging yourself out of the position. But guess what? Just one big gain is going to be much greater than the money you would have saved by micromanaging yourself out of the position. Howard says, agree. The first book is way better despite reputation of second book. Yeah, the second book has this huge reputation. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's not a bad book. I've got it both on my bookshelf here. I have them both on my bookshelf. Uh, read them both, absolutely. But the first book is just really, really struck a card with me. And it was the first really serious work in, in trading psychology. I mean, of course, live a war. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, Hope your trip was great. It was, Howard. Thank you. Uh, what percent of people listening today have a written plan more or less than 50%? What percent profitable with a written plan or without a written plan? I have no idea. I have no idea because um, I'm not sure people are going to answer you honestly on that. Um, who knows? Okay. Uh, or it says, how do you determine your profit target? Um, that's a very lengthy conversation. Uh, the bottom line is, it's the same distance for the initial profit target. It's the same distance as the stop. So we're looking for one and one on the initial trade. I have two uh, seminars. And each week I say this. I keep forgetting. Nobody's asked me, so they must be out there. On YouTube, I have two weekend charts that I put out there. They were back-to-back -back just on setting stops. And then if you go back further, I have two webinars on risk uh, versus reward, and it were two. Uh, we ended up spending two weeks on both of those topics, so four weeks total. So uh, go in and, and read those, uh, see those YouTubes. If you can't find them, uh, let me know, and I'll try to figure out which which ones they were. I, I I don't do a great job of archiving all these things; I just put them out there. But I need to start describing them a little better. So I realize that's a problem. The problem is on the next trade, you wonder if you could plan correctly. Well. Uh, yeah, I mean, that comes with experience. It, with experience, you know where to get in, where to get out, and where to set your stop. Now, I don't want to blow too much smoke, but I've been at this a while, and I have a pretty good idea. I have a pretty good idea where to get in. I have a pretty good idea how to pick the best stocks. I have a pretty good idea how to eyeball the volatility and set the stop and set the initial profit target. So I do all of these things in my trading service. Okay, and they're right there. Okay, does it always work? No. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. But you can see, I did a plan for you here. Not that I don't want you to be able to plan for yourself. I mean, I, I, could, I could get hit by a beer truck tomorrow. Okay? But if you're having trouble or if you would like someone to be part of your staff and to find setups for you or help you find setups and help you set those stops, okay? If I could find just one, like if, let's say you didn't see this ruby, well, you're doing pretty damn good and you're pretty far ahead of the game. Now, my service isn't cheap, okay? And that's to keep the, uh, keep the riffraff out, right? <laughs> Uh, but you get one of these trades a year, and you pay you paid for the service uh, maybe several times over if it uh, keeps running. Now let's say that here's the deal. Okay, it's sixteen sixty the second loaf. Let's say the stock runs to a hundred. It could happen. Okay, 
Well, if that happens, then you're going to be up, let's say, another 80 points. And you got 333 shares. So that's another $26,000. Okay, so round numbers, really round numbers. You could make, well, all, all together, this one trade could turn into a 30% gain in the overall portfolio. It doesn't happen often, but it can happen to where you have this huge winner. All you need is a few winners. If you've got a stock that made 30% in your overall portfolio, and you only risk 2%, okay, and you made 30% of your overall portfolio, then obviously you could have quite a few other losers and then quite a few other mediocre trades, and you had a pretty good year. So catch one or two of these big winners a year. Is this going to turn into the model of all trades? I don't know. I have no idea. That's what being a trend follower is all about. So, you know, like they say in Frozen, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Okay? And follow your plan while you're at it. And just let it go. It's that simple. Okay? I never said it was easy. It's that simple, though. I drop a lot of F-bombs. I don't throw too much stuff, but every now and then I might throw something. Okay? So I still have a pulse. I still get pissed off. I'm still human, but over the years, I find myself doing that less and less and less, and it just is. And it's like I'm almost at a point where I'm flippant. I get into position. I don't care, okay, and and not completely flippant, but almost to a point where it's like, so what? If I know deep down that it looks good and it's viable, okay, then so what? Let the chips fall where they may. It's taken me a long time to get to that point. And I realize that if you're a little newer to trading, it will likely take you a long time too. If it doesn't, I, I would be a little jealous because I have my, I, you know, we all have scars in this business and it does take a while to reach that point. But one thing that I, I have done that has really helped me is I always do a post-mortem on everything. And then, like right now, I'm way behind on, on um, adding up uh, official recommendations and, and stuff, like from the service, for instance. But when I do that, I take a second or third or fourth look at that trade, and I ask myself, would I have, take, would I have taken that trade, given what I know now? Now, of course, you have to pull the hindsight out of the equation, but every now and then, I'll see one and I'll, I'll think, what the hell was I thinking on that trade? But I found that that has happened less and less and less and less throughout the years. So that practice, and I'm not bragging, but that practice has made me better. That practice has made me sit on my hands during choppy markets, okay? So I'm not bragging because there might be months and months where nothing happens, where I'm not adding anything to my bottom line. But I'm also not taken away from it by taking crappy trades. So that patience comes with time. That experience comes with time. And, you know, I'm not perfect in what I do by a long shot. But you will get better with time, and you will, you will be able to follow your plan more and more. And, again, who cares what happens on a trade? It, it, and I know it's hard to even imagine that if you hadn't been trading that long. But it's it's almost like if a trade works out, if it, it's like I, I don't get as excited about things anymore either. And I think that's important too. You have to kind of be a little bit more even keeled, do the right thing, and let everything work its way out. I know I'm kind of going in circles here. Your rants are great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I used to uh, I used to go home. My wife would say, how'd you do? And I'm like, eh, I rambled a lot. I don't know. I think they got it. I don't know. And I'd feel kind of eh, bizarre about that or strange, and I wasn't sure what happened. And somebody once uh, emailed me because I think I said, ah, I keep rambling on. And they're like, no, no, no. <laughs> I learned more when you're just rambling on than when you're trying to directly tell me something. So keep up those rants. So it takes a lot of punches. And, he, and Martin says, in parentheses, losses to get used to them. Yeah, it does. It takes a while. 
Uh, if you don't have a plan, one big punch loss. I had one in 2009, didn't come back to investigate for two years. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing, too. You can't. You can't let something get away with you. Sooner or later, it will. And sooner or later, you will get burnt. And that's where damage control and all these other things I talk about and how to mitigate that and how to maybe survive and sometimes even profit from an adverse situation will happen. But you can't let stupidity make you do something wrong. And then, like I said earlier, uh, like I said before, I should say not earlier, but let's say, like sometimes I'm updating these spreadsheets, and evidently I'll, evidently, every now and then I'll fat finger or something, like like move a decimal place or something. And and then I'll look at the results, and I'll be like, wow, you know, when I'm punching in the, the, the trades. And if you, if you, let's say you've got, um, oh, I don't know, $20,000 in a position, and you let that thing go against you, you let it go to zero, well, you've lost 20% on your portfolio, and making back that 20% is going to be really hard because guess what? Maybe somebody could do the math for me. What's um, going to be like 100 divided by 80? Would that be it? Yeah, you got to make back 25% of your entire portfolio to make back that one loss, and that's not going to be an easy feat. So you have to be diligent in the way you – um, execute things. And then, I don't know if I said this before or not, but follow your plan. Uh, somebody wants to see the uh, open portfolio. There it is. Uh, this is the Ruby. We put that, we excerpted that uh, for the thing. This was the initial profit target. Notice your, I'm not going to spend much time. Watch some YouTubes out there. I've got plenty of them out there. Or get the entire archives off my website on a flash drive. You want to watch them at home. Um, but Again, we're looking for 1% on the first loaf and some sort of multiple on the second loaf, on the second half of the position. Hopefully, I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully this number becomes very huge and that makes all the difference in the world. I'm not as worried about percent correct as long as we could bang out some big numbers at just one of these positions, okay, by following the plan, then I'm okay, okay. Then everything, then this number down here takes care of itself but every now and then you'll get uh, I don't hate to use the word lucky but you'll get lucky where you have a high percent correct because everything's working in your favor and that's fine but I would rather have I'd rather make more money than be correct and, and again that's that's a problem in trading is that a lot of people would rather be right than make money and you're like oh Dave I just want to make money well you know Bolshevik I see a lot of people that would rather be right than make money. You'd be surprised. <clears throat> I consider area of loss as a punch. It's really difficult to try again after 10 punches in a row. Well, 10 times in a row, um, it could happen. But as I preach, and I've seen people email me 20 times in a row, and I've said this a 1,000 times. I'll say a 1,000 more times. If you get stopped out 10 or 20 times in a row, you've got two problems and likely a combination of both. Your stops are too tight. You did not fully understand, recognize, and embrace the volatility of the underlying instrument. Okay? And number two, your stock selection could use a little bit of work. And that's why I did a course just on stock selection because I realized that's the missing piece. I could show you a TKO. I could show you a persistent pullback. I could show you a bow tie show you all these wonderful patterns and give you some tips and tricks on, on how they work and when to use them. But until you learn how to pick the best stocks, they're not going to work that greatly for you. And I learned that early in my career, and then I realized how much it's missing a little bit later in my career for those people who are getting up to speed on the methodology. And there's not enough time to get into that in any more details. But, yeah, your stock selection – uh, could use a little work. Oh, good to hear. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you think it's important to have a written plan? Um, well, yeah. But you don't have to get, I mean, okay, if you're, I sound like Nicholas Fine. Okay, well, uh, okay, uh, what are these things? And then, uh, well, you know, <laughs> uh, but yes, if, 
if you're newer to trading, then download it off my website. Um, I have, if you go into education, I have a, go to education, go to free education. And this is, um, and if you have layman's, you can copy it straight out of layman's. So let's see if we can find plan, P-L-A-N. Um, right here. Go to this PDF right here. And um, there, here we go, right there. There it is. So if you click on that, it's going to go to my Amazon server, and it's going to it's going to be a sheet on planning your trade. So go there and um, print that out. Okay. If you do err uh, to trading, now I've been around a lot. I've got a lot going on over here. Okay. So as far as planning my trades, I don't necessarily do this written plan anymore. I would recommend you do this written plan if you're newer to trading. All I do now is punch it into a spreadsheet. Okay. So like down here, you can't see it because I've got, I purposely have it blurred out because it's a live trade for today. Okay. But I have an entry. I have a protective stop. And then over here, I have an initial profit target. You can't see that either. Okay. Just like you can see, my initial risk was three. This was my stop on this one. This was my entry on this one. And my profit target was 28. Okay, we hit that. And what do we do? We took some profits. Okay. So the plan now is to loosen up that stop a little bit as it moves more and more in our favor and ride it out. So hopefully this number becomes a real big number. So what do we do tomorrow on this stock? Well, if it hits the stop, we get out. If it doesn't hit the stop, we stay in. It's that easy. It's that easy, okay? Now, trading is not easy, but it should be that easy as far as honoring your stop. If it hits the stop, it hits the stop. You know, let's go back to the, uh, let's go back to this one. Okay, our stop's right around here somewhere. Okay? So if, Today, tomorrow, the next day, it comes down and hits a stop. What should we do? Get out. Today, tomorrow, the next day, it doesn't hit the stop. What should we do? We stay in. That's all we do. Okay? Hi, Dave. Have you looked at it ever increasing your position size when a chart pattern still looks good? No. Such as dead buddy situation and it's close to the stop, so the stop would loss would be small. No. No. Now. I've tried everything in the past, okay, and I think I might have tried that too, but that's probably uh, a bad idea. Let me see if I can get a blank screen on here. So he's saying you get into a position, it does that. Let's say you get in here, and then it goes does this, okay. Well, if you're almost getting stopped out, he's saying, like, well, let's, why not add to this position, just in case it turns around, so your risk is only this much on an add-on position. Well, that's fine and dandy, but what happens if the stock gaps open and this added position, now you're down 10 points overnight, okay? The next thing to do, and I've preached this a thousand times, is obsess before you get into a trade, not afterwards. If this market is headed lower or even sideways, then it has lost momentum. Well, Dave, how come you don't get out? Well, because that is not my plan. But I'm not going to add because I'm looking for perfection before I get in. So look for perfection right here. Got a nice trend. Let's say this trend's accelerating higher. Pulls back. Looks good. Okay. This looks like the mother of all setups. I think I'm going to do great this trade. Okay. But if things start going against me, well, I see this trade as a, um, I don't know, complete package I follow through with, and I don't want to mess with things, and I certainly don't want to buy this stock while it's going down, okay? But I'm willing to let it go and see what happens. Just let the chips fall where they may is what... I told somebody once, and, and all of a sudden it clicked with them. That was the right terminology, right phraseology that they needed to wrap their head around the situation. 
Yeah, page one hundred nine in layman's. That's that. That's that. That's where I got the PDF. That's just a screenshot from the book. It's all it is. So if you have the book, you have my permission to make multiple copies of that page. Any other page, I think it's ten dollars a copy with permission. Um, and uh, first trade you ever took with your ID, sand my portfolio is not in the black yet. First trade you ever took. First trade you ever took with your ID is not in the black yet. Oh, so first, I think what you're trying to say is your first trade you ever did with me is not in the black. Okay, well, um, I don't know. Yeah, okay, so that one was around the ninth. Okay. Well, this one is the black, is in the black since then. This one's not, and this one's on the cusp of being in the black. Okay. Um. Yeah, I mean, you know, you might get a few stinkers from me. That's one thing I can guarantee. It's about the only thing I can guarantee, okay? But I would think longer term, you're going to have some that look like this and some that look like this, okay? And then that's going to make up for a stinker like this, okay? So it takes time. You don't make money every day. You don't make money every week. And you might even go in trend following a year where you don't, make a whole lot of forward progress. Most people give up before they hit the mother load in a methodology and they end up perpetually out of phase. Nobody sticks with anything long enough. Now there is one little random thought that comes to mind. Just be careful that if you are, let's say you're selling options or doing something leveraged and you're making money doing that, don't forget that there is there is a possibility you could blow up doing that type of thing. Okay? So uh, I guess what I'm saying is don't let that um, initial success uh, go to your head and think that it will always be like this permanent income hypothesis. The the best traders, just to kind of keep the random thoughts going, the best traders that I have worked with are those who come in in less than ideal times and then have things improve versus those who come in in good times and have things um, blow up. As I've said before, and I'm not picking on this one person because I can think about four or five just off the top of my head. I've had people um, instantly want to quit their jobs, and, and, and hopefully they didn't, but give up like an established business because trading is, they made 20% trading. They would have to really work really hard in their existing business with low margins or whatever to, to, make, such, to make so much money. And then what happens is uh, the first little drawdown they hit, they they just abandoned the whole methodology. And then guess what? Right about the time they abandoned it, of course, the market takes off again, and they would have printed money once again. So the the people who do the worst are those who come in at good times, and the people that do the best are those who come in in less than ideal conditions and do poorly. Um, and if you're looking at one trade, you're looking at one trade of maybe a 1,000 that, that are going to be made, and it's meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. So, you know, sorry your first trade is not working out. Um, but longer term, you stick with it. I can't guarantee you'll do okay. Um, but it's worked for me. Gladwell quotes 10,000 hours. Yes, to become more proficient. Four to five years which gives you exposure to multiple market types. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think I can shorten that learning curve quite a bit. If you listen to me, okay, I could take the steepest side of the learning curve, but most aren't going to listen. And and again, it's not my way or highway, but I think I've stumbled upon, upon something, and it, it used to be a lot more complex than it was, and now I've kind of boiled it down to its essence. I think Einstein said, make everything as simple as possible and no simpler. I think that's, I think I'm on the cusp of no simpler at this point. My random thought was to sell some covered calls on a loser not hitting a stop. No, 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 follow the plan, okay? So you sell a call. Now you have, now you have another moving part. What if the stock goes down and hits a stop? Well, you got a short call. A short call is making money. What if it hits a stop and then the stock takes off? And now you have unlimited losses on your call. What if the stock doesn't at the stop, it then takes off, 
Now you have limited your gains. Now that 30% gain I talked about earlier, doesn't happen often, but it can. You immediately scratch that off of now you no longer have that gain. So, no, I, it, I, I see what you're saying. You're not going to actually do it. You just thought about it. Yeah, don't don't add any unnecessarily any unnecessary moving parts. Again, boil it down to its assets. Make it as simple as possible, but no similar. No, no. Uh, if I wanted to invest fifty thousand dollars, two percent max position, does that mean I have to own fifty stocks? No, Gary. Go in and watch. Go in and watch the two shows that I did on stops. They're on YouTube. Two percent is if you're stopped out. That's how much you're going to risk on the trade. Okay. We're not putting two percent of the account into each trade, and we're going to let it go to zero. No, we're going to stop ourselves out. For instance, three point stop on here. We're going to stop out at 22 if it doesn't work, okay? So we're risking three points of the trade. We're not risking 25 points on the trade, okay? Yeah, go in and watch those um, videos. Okay, we've gone way long. I don't know if we can have much time to get to the uh, stocks today, but I'll give it a shot. So if y'all want to um, start asking about stocks, do that now. I'll go through the market as quickly as possible. And I'll hang around a few more uh, days. I called <laughs> Don. That's exactly what I was going to say. Um, okay, a couple of announcements here. Um, in prior shows, I said that. In prior shows, I said I wasn't sure uh, when I was going to end the um, the special on the stock selection course. And um, looks like my hand is not forced, but. Um, I'm, um, I haven't really done any outside marketing, and, and I've been approached to do some outside marketing. I think I'm going to probably uh, let that unfold, and that, that just saves me from, from – I don't want to market. I don't want to do accounting. I don't want to market. I don't do all these things. I want to look at charts. I want to do chart shows, and I want to trade. That's all I want to do, okay? I don't want to do all this nitty-gritty. So um, it's possible that I could be working some deals with someone that will, that will unload some of this from me and, and part of that unwinding uh, one of the things is I'm going to probably end up decoupling some things and one of the first things that will probably get decoupled well will get decoupled is going to be the stock selection uh, course right now if you buy the stock selection course you get an entire year of the service free uh, the mechanics of making that happen with uh, some of these things that are going to be emulate, em, eh, emulated or aren't going to really um, be so easy, so I think I'm going to decouple those things. In fact, I know I will as of Friday, uh, three six fifteen. Okay. Um, so right now, if you get the stock selection course, you get one year free of my trading service, and that's going to go away again um, in a little bit over a week. And you can go to my store, check it out right here. Okay. Um, and if you do get a course, you do get unlimited lifetime support. Now, unlimited is related to the course, and keep in mind, a lot of times you ask a question, I'll say, I might give you a quick answer, but then most of the time my answer will be go back and rewatch that part of the course, okay? And then like with the IPO course, if you do see an IPO you think it's interesting, it's okay to ask me about it, see what I think. Uh, and again, I'll probably tell you go rewatch the course, and I'll give you my thumbs up or thumbs down on it. But a limited lifetime support obviously doesn't mean, hey, Dave, I'm building a trading system. Uh, can you help me? That's a little bit different type of uh, consulting, and that's much more expensive. But as far as the course is concerned, I will uh, do whatever I can to support the courses. Okay. Anyway, uh, enough of that. So check that out if you're if you're on the fence stock selection course. I'm not. Um, uh, what's what's what I'm trying to say? We're we're just gonna just because of the way things are shaking out. I'm gonna start decoupling some of these things. All right. Enough of that. Let's get to the charts. Um, ran really long today. That was not my intention either. Okay, let's take a look at the overall market. And the lesson is, don't fight the tape. Don't fight the tape, okay? Yeah, we're down a little bit today, but so what? So far, market's broken out. P's have broken out of the range. So far, so good. Um, ideally, you know me, I want to see this market accelerate higher, look like that, and then have a little bit of a pullback along the way, and we'd have a plethora of setups. But in the meantime, we just take things one day at a time.
Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ right now, it's up a smidge, right at about 15-year highs, 14-year highs. Nice persistent move in here. So far, so good. So um, it looks great. And the breakout there is pretty darn good. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going through these sectors. But if you look at areas like the semis, which I've been pretty excited about in here lately, if I can find them. Here we go. Semis have had a really good breakout. I'm kind of old school, and I, I like the semis to um, confirm what I'm seeing in the overall market. Do you use discretion on taking new trades if you think the overall market seems overextended and possibly too for a pullback? Uh, Greg, if I really like the setup, I'm going to take it, okay? But if I'm looking at the setup and I already have some positions in that area, I mean, there's, there's, there's quite a few things. It's not a simple, quick answer. As a quick answer, uh, yes, but as a little bit lengthier answer, if I really like a setup, I'll take it regardless of what the market's doing, but it's got to be a good-looking setup, okay? And then, um, but if it's kind of mediocre and the market's extended and I already have some positions in that, uh, in that area, then it's like, you know what, I might just hold off, okay, on that position. So the bottom line is if you really, really, really like something, then take it, okay? All right. Um, most sectors look pretty good. I'm not going to spend, again, a lot of time doing them. Uh, it's kind of cool that recently some of these sectors corrected. Look like they might be kind of losing steam, like the drugs and biotech, et cetera. But they turn around and going right back up. So flip through these charts of your sectors when you get a chance. Uh, retail, at or near new highs, restaurants, leisure, closing in on new highs. So most areas looking pretty good. Like I wrote in the column this morning, some areas like utilities and real estate or anything that's interest sensitive could be in trouble. I still think the energies are bottoming out, and I thought gold has bottomed out, but um, honor your stops just in case because it seems to be taking a while to get going. Trans, you want to take a look at the trannies? Uh, do I have them in here? No, I have here. Let's see. <sighs> yeah, transports, bases, this index. Uh, you know, they're a little bit of a bummer because they really haven't broken out decisively, but I don't worry about the transports that much. I know there's old school people that uh, Dow theorists are uh, pretty excited about the transports. But, yeah, you're right. The transports are kind of lagging a little bit, but so what? You can't have everything. If you did, where would you put it? Right? I think Wright said that. Okay, UAN. Well, I don't like today's gap. Okay, so that would immediately raise an eyebrow on that. Let's back the chart out a little bit. It looks okay. It's got some uh, bad memories along the way. But uh, I think I would pass. Just what, just today's gap doesn't look too good in here. And it's not really set up just yet. Your transitional pattern was back here. Let's see where the bow tie was. See, your bow tie was way back here. So now you're in a, like a second tier type of setup. If you're long, stay long. You look good and then. Invax? Invax were long, right? Or are we? Maybe I think of NVRO. Uh, no, we're not long this one yet. <laughs> uh, quick, look away from the screen. Pulled in the sneaker on me. Who said, who asked about that one? You better not be on the service. Following a plan is hard. Well, just do it. You know what you, you know what you could do? Money management will cure multitudes of sins. So if you can't follow the plan at, at, at a 2% position size, then just take a 1% position. If you can't follow a plan at a 1% position size, then take a half a percent position. If you can't follow a plan at a half a percent position size, then take a quarter of a percent position size. Okay? To where you're trading so little, so what? Okay? And if you could if you could start following your plan at a quarter of a percent, well, first of all, if you can't follow a plan at a quarter percent, Maybe you shouldn't be trading. Maybe there's something else you should be doing, okay? I hate to tell anyone not to trade if they really want to do it. But if you really want to do it, you, you should be following your plan at a quarter percent. Yeah, I know it's kind of hard to follow if you're trading at a bigger size and, and, and you realize, oh, I just lost the equivalent of a car payment or I just um, 
loss equivalent of um, you know a child's tuitions payment for last month or whatever the case may be, and you're monetizing that. It's kind of bumming you out. Okay, uh, I get that, but if you Reduce your share size down to a point where it's almost meaningless. Like I say, money management will cure a multitude of sins. And that's why in layman's, I talked a lot about the importance of money management, not in and of itself, but as it relates to the psychology of trading. And that if you're trading at a smaller size, it's going to be much easier to follow your plan. So again, if you can't follow your plan, back off, back off, back off on your share size until you can. And then also get educated and make sure your stock selection is up to par. Make sure you fully understand the position when you go again. Make sure you pick the best and leave the rest. And it's a little cliche, but if you went through the entire course and you start implementing that and start looking at those two or 3,000 stocks a day, then you should be doing fine. If you're following me, not that I'm always be correct, follow me for – uh, you know, that's the problem. And sometimes it might take six, six to nine months. Sometimes it might take a year and even sometimes even longer to catch a really good trend. But just follow it long enough until you reap the fruits of your labor and until you get it. Now, trade at a little tiny size the whole time you're doing that. And then once you get it, then you'll do just fine. Okay. But yeah, trade small. Calvin says, financial success in anything comes back to money management. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fully agree. Nice show, Dave. MLNX. All right. Let's take a look at that. No. Who asked about that? No. Looks like electrocardiogram. Where's Nicholas? I mean, I hear you. It's breaking out, okay? But uh, it's kind of all over the place. Let it break out, okay? And then see what happens. Now, if it breaks out decisively, maybe you look to play your first pullback. Okay? No problem. But shorter term, it's kind of all over the place. So why would you want to trade a stock that looks like this and it's bouncing all around when the underlying sector looks like this? Okay? I mean, look at that. So this is you could this is a whole sector. And usually sectors or any fish or e fish I should say, they don't make those moves. So yeah, you could find much better. Steve, not to pick on you, but I think you can. Tesla is a short. Ugh. Well, Phil, it's kind of all over the place. Um, you know, to me, it looked like it was a short way back here as a transitional setup, but now it's kind of all over the place. I don't see. I know you have your own way of trading, as, as many of you do, which is fine. And, and you know, keep me on staff to, to be your um, momentum guy. I mean, I've got some people that do a lot of different things. But they need a momentum guy, and that's why they hire me on to be the momentum guy, knowing that they like the way I pick stocks, they like the way I trade the trends, but they're doing something different. And uh, that seems to dovetail in nicely with their with the way they're doing things. And, and that's I'm flattered, okay, especially since they're doing what they do. But anyway, uh, there's nothing for my methodology here. I mean, if you're short, stay short because it looks like it's in trouble longer term. And if you back the chart way out, yeah, it looks like it's in a lot of trouble. But it's just too wide and loose. I don't see anything there. Yeah, he says hit moving average. I know he's doing it. Phil, Phil plays a moving average. He's doing that 50-day moving average thing. He's playing bounces off of it. That's fine. You know, like I said, if you're successful with what you're doing, uh, keep doing it. YX, DX, possible turnaround. All right, let's see it. Y, N, D, X. Yeah, it looks a little, little early to me. Let's zoom in a little bit. Yeah, uh, a little too early uh, for my taste. And then you've got quite a bit of uh, of overhead supply right now. So I think it's too early on this one. I hear you, though. I see where it's bottoming out. A little too early, Heather. And, you know, if you're ever confused when something's bottoming out, uh, wait for the bow tie, okay? So wait for the bow tie, and then let's reevaluate this because it's just, just trying to meander along. This low, okay. Rick says hi. Oh, is there an extra I on that? H I I. Let's see. H I I. Uh, yeah, I mean it's banging on new highs, but it's not set up. Okay, so this should go into your momentum list because look, it's accelerating higher, but until it makes a trend knockout or some sort of pullback, it's not set up. 
Okay. You're welcome, Heather. CBI for Greg. CBI. Uh, well, I immediately see a little bit of overhead supply here. Um, it doesn't jump out at me as anything. Um, and it's not set up right now. I mean, I see where you can see your, it's sort of bottomed out here. Probably bow tied or something. But it's already triggered off of that. Yeah, you had a bow tie. You had to pull back in here. So it's already triggered at all. You, now you got overhead supply to deal with. So I don't, it's just not jumping out of me as a great setup at this point in time because it's not set up. UAN. Yeah, we just did that one. Don's here. Guess what he wants to know about? Ford. Uh, it's just kind of drifting along higher. It's not doing anything that would get me excited. It looks like electrocardiogram gram longer term, so uh, nope. Stick to it. Try to, try to pick stocks within the methodology. Uh, uh, Doug. And we did that one. C-Y-R-N. Um, let's zoom in a little bit on this one and check it out. It's okay. Um, I don't like stocks that have these huge, big, random up days within. But if I'm just looking at this here and this little kind of knockout move, then I hear you. So I'm going to give it a not bad. I don't like this here, though. Okay. And then it's got a lot of uh, fluff and overhead over here. So I think I'm going to pass on that. You bought SFM long. All right. So does that mean? Okay. That's a loaded question now. Yeah, I like it, but I don't see your uh I don't see why you'd be long unless you got long yesterday. But yeah, shorter term it looks okay. You've got a pullback. Uh volatility a little low for me, less than twenty. Remember earlier I said I don't really like stocks a whole lot less than twenty. But uh I'll give you an okay. It's not getting ready to bang on all time highs, which would be which would help, but uh it's okay. But only on an entry. S I G M. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's already triggered. It looked pretty good. Um, you know, you had a pretty big move in here. It did really pull back, though. It just kind of bumped along, bumped along. So it didn't set up perfectly. But I hear you. So far, so good. But it would have to keep breaking out and then uh, pull back again. I'm going to have to shut things down in just a minute. Uh, Chris, not too bad. Uh, I think you asked about this a little while back. It's gotten through most of its overhead supply. Uh, it's okay. It has some more overhead supply to deal with here. So I'm going to give that an okay. Um, my only other concern is that it ran from 125 to three bucks and change, so that's like a 300% move uh, round numbers. So that's a little, little bit, uh, a little bit too much on the cusp of too much of a move. Do the odds favor continuation for the second time price is moving through support or resistance as opposed to just the first time? Is the idea behind a pullback methodology? Well, I'm not sure exactly what you're saying. Uh, but we are trading pullbacks. But if you do have, um, I mean, if you move, if it, if if the resistance, let me see how to do this. Um, if the resistance has already been broken, then I don't worry as much about this, okay? If the resistance is above the market and it hasn't been broken through yet, then I'm concerned about it. I hope that I hope I answered your question. Uh, if not, uh, shoot me an email. We'll uh, cover it next week. Uh, look, uh, we're, we're kind of... Ran a little long today, so I want to shut things down just so we can make sure we get a good recording. Um, as you can tell, I love doing these shows. I have a blast doing them. Thanks for showing up. I appreciate it. Uh, don't forget, again, uh, the stock selection free year to service will no longer be part of the stock selection course beginning next Friday. I guess next Friday at midnight. So if you're interested in that, if you're on the fence, let me know. And, um, and make sure you, you take care of that before next Friday. And this might be one of those things where I can't undo it once it's undone. So if, if I'm letting someone else take it over. Anyway, I feel like I'm apologizing for that. But uh, uh, everybody have a fantastic weekend. We'll talk again. Anything I answer, davidalander.com. I'll either answer you directly or if it's um, a more detailed answer, I will. Uh, I'll, it'll be fodder for next week's show. Thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you, Dave. Dave says he's, uh, he's going for the course. I appreciate that, man. Um, have a good one. And uh, I guess we'll talk again next week. Thank you so much.